Welcome to Cinematic Excrements. I hope you're all enjoying your holiday season, whether you celebrate Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, or a Festivus for the rest of us. As you know, unless you're watching for the first time, in which case, welcome, I am reviewing every movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture in chronological order. However, in light of the holiday season, I thought we should skip ahead to a holiday movie that has won Worst Picture honors. Unfortunately, there is only one such movie that has done so, and that is Kirk Cameron Saving Christmas. And I already did that one a few years ago, so that's really not going to work. Instead, I think we should do a movie that was nominated for Worst Picture, but ultimately did not win. So how many movies do we have to choose from? Two? That's it? All those crappy holiday movies out there, and you're telling me only two were nominated for Worst Picture, apart from Saving Christmas. God, that can't be right. And if it's not, I'm sure I'll hear about it down in the comments, but for now, the superimposed caption has spoken. So, let's see what's behind door number one. Hmm. Surviving Christmas. I don't know. I mean, I've heard bad things, but... I don't know if something like that is really going to give me enough material for a full review. Well, what's behind door number two? Surviving Christmas it is. Inflicted upon the movie going public in 2004, Surviving Christmas was directed by Mike Mitchell. You may know him as the director of other forgettable films like Deuce Bigelow Male Gigolo, Shrek Forever After, Alvin and the Chipmunks Chipwrecked, Trolls, and The Lego Movie 2? Really? Well, blind squirrels and all that. The movie stars Ben Affleck in what could generously be described as a slump in his career, with Surviving Christmas being the fourth in a string of underperforming films, the previous three being Geely, Paycheck, and Jersey Girl. Surviving Christmas began production in Chicago, where the movie takes place, and most of the exterior shots were done, and there were rumors of trouble on set early on. Reportedly, the cast and crew had to deal with a verbally abusive DP, though he was eventually replaced. Jennifer Lopez, Affleck's girlfriend at the time, would occasionally visit the set, and once got into a spat with Affleck's co-star and love interest in the film, Christina Applegate, they also started filming without a completed script, requiring the cast to do some improvisation. At one point, Point, Affleck's co-star James Gandolfini got fed up and locked himself in his trailer for a full day, refusing to come out unless the script was reworked. The studio agreed and suspended production for rewrites, though this meant a few exterior shots had to be done later in Los Angeles. Originally, the film was planned for a Christmas 2003 release, but when Geely embarrassed everyone involved that summer and the studio lost faith in Affleck's star power, they decided to push it back to October of 2004. Because Halloween is the best time to release a Christmas movie, it did, however, ultimately get a Christmas 2004 release. On home video. Now, normally a studio would wait until the following year's holiday season to release a holiday movie on home video for obvious reasons. But it took Surviving Christmas less than two months to go from big screen to small screen. I assume because the studio just wanted to rip the band-aid off and be done with it. Surviving Christmas only managed to bring in about $15 million against a $45 million budget. I'm sure part of that could be attributed to the questionable release date, but most likely the biggest factor was that it, you know, sucked. It was panned by critics and audiences alike and was nominated for three Golden Raspberry Awards, Worst Picture and Worst Screenplay, losing both to Catwoman, and Worst Actor, which it lost to George W. Bush for Fahrenheit 9-11. Which is a documentary. Now oh, that's just lazy. I don't like Bush either, but come on. Well, let's see why Surviving Christmas sucked big jingle balls. It opens with a montage of Chicago at Christmas, interspersed with scenes of an unbelievably incompetent schmuck trying to wrap a present, and an old woman who commits suicide by sticking her head in her oven. Comedy! Believe it or not, there's an alternate version of this opening montage that was actually worse. In addition to the old lady and the oven, it features a man who tosses all of his valuables into a Salvation Army bin before jumping into traffic, a man who electrocutes himself in the bathtub, and a man who jumps off the roof. Merry Christmas! Oddly enough, the dude throwing away his wallet and jewelry is still in the theatrical cut of the movie, but his suicide is not, which makes this scene very confusing. But it does explain this line from a behind-the-scenes interview with Christina Applegate. Our goal is to make you disturbed and confused. Well, mission accomplished. 
Anyway, Mr. Affleck plays Drew Latham, a rich and successful asshole, uh, ad executive who we first see pitching an ad that tells people to buy spiked eggnog so they can stomach being around their family for the holidays. I'm not kidding, that's actually his pitch. And they go for it. I mean, I can understand if it was a bit more specific, like, here's to putting up with your racist uncle. But no, it's just family in general, like all families are universally bad. Merry Christmas! I'm a genius. Are you? Also, what was up with that exhale? I'm a genius. <sighs> After that nonsense, he attempts to surprise his girlfriend, Missy, with a trip to Fiji for Christmas. And my god, this apartment has a lot of empty floor space. You could fit a half court in there. But I digress. The trip to Fiji does not go over well, and boy is this scene... a lot. First of all, surprising someone with a vacation on short notice is kinda dumb. Usually people have to, you know, plan these things in advance. What if she can't get time off from work? That said, her reaction is ridiculously over the top. She isn't just unhappy with this, she is downright offended that he wants to take a trip on Christmas. And now I'm having flashbacks to Christmas with the Cranks, which came out the same year, I believe. 2004, a banner year for holiday films. I can understand being upset about the short notice, but lots of people go on vacation for Christmas. It's not that weird. I mean, it would be kind of weird this year, but only because we have a deadly virus ravaging the globe and it's best for everyone to stay home. You are staying home this year, right? Right? Christmas is the family holiday. I'm sorry, Christmas is the family holiday? Like it's the only one? Mother's Day, Father's Day, Thanksgiving, none of those count? Nope, okay. Sorry, she has spoken. Christmas is the family holiday. Oh, you don't celebrate Christmas? Well, too bad. No family holiday for you. And then she continues to rant about family and how Drew never even talks about his family, which is weird. And he gives a really lame excuse for doing so, saying if he told her everything, it would take the mystery out of their relationship. And then it's no fun anymore. Buddy, if you're intending for this to be a serious relationship, the very existence of your family should not be a mystery. Missy ain't buying this and continues to insist literally everything is about family. And she's going home to spend Christmas with her family, damn it. Hey, let's play a drinking game. Take a shot every time she says the word family. Ready? Go. Christmas is the family holiday. You've never introduced me to your family. You've never even mentioned your family. Do you even have a family? How can you be serious about me? If you're not serious about your own family, I'm going to spend Christmas with my family. <sighs> Jesus Christ. Ooh. Ooh. That's hitting quick. Okay. This was a mistake. Oh, no, oh, no. Oh. Oh boy. This is sitting a lot flatter than I fasted would, but that's that that's okay. It's alright. I I can do this. I am a grown man wearing a Santa hat, and I can handle a lid bit oh well nope, there go my knees. Hi, Floor. Merry Christmas. I apologize in advance if I throw up on you. Okay, welcome back, everyone. I do apologize for that little interlude. I won't be doing that again. Probably. So, where were we? After his girlfriend tells him to get stuffed, Drew desperately calls everyone he knows to ask if he can please spend Christmas with them. This doesn't go well, as it turns out this rich douchebag doesn't have any real friends. And that's probably the only realistic thing about this movie. In a fit of desperation, he somehow tracks down his girlfriend's therapist in an airport, which might explain why she's in therapy, and begs him for advice. To make the crazy man go away, the therapist tells Drew it might help to revisit something from his childhood. So he takes a trip to the house he grew up in, which is now occupied by some other family, the Valcos, and they don't take kindly to the crazy person hanging out on their front lawn, and Jesus! Dude, you're not playing Tony Soprano in this movie! Tone it down! 
Tom Falco, played by James Gandolfini, brings the poor unconscious bastard inside, and his wife, Christine, played by Catherine O'Hara, tries to make him feel a bit more welcome by giving him a tour of his childhood home. She even feeds him, despite Tom's objections. But after dinner, even she's had enough of this guy. Tom, why don't you see the man out? You don't want to let him in. What do you mean, let him in? You didn't let anybody in. You brained him with a snow shovel and then dragged his unconscious body into your foyer. But before he leaves, Drew comes up with a rather strange proposition. Why don't the Valcos pretend to be his family for the holidays? Naturally, Tom's answer is... No. I'll pay you $250,000. Welcome home, son. Yes, this is the actual premise for the movie. Drew is essentially renting a family for Christmas so he can try to reclaim his happy childhood memories. They have a lawyer draw up a contract and everything. And as part of the contract, he gets to sleep in his old bedroom, which means the Valco's actual son, Brian, has to freeze his ass off in the garage. What the hell, Tom and Christine? You're getting a quarter mil out of this. Put him in a hotel or something, jeez. Now I can't help but notice an obvious flaw with this premise. Drew is so desperate to spend Christmas with literally anybody that he pays a family of complete strangers a quarter mil. But Drew, there was never any reason for you to go through all of this because, and I can't believe I have to spell this out, you have a girlfriend! Well, okay, you had a girlfriend. Right now you're on a break, but before you screwed everything up with this Fiji nonsense, you could have just asked to spend Christmas with her family. And that is why this premise does not work. The only reason anything happens the way it does is because all of the main characters are stupid. Well, almost. A day later, the Valco's daughter Alicia, played by Christina Applegate, and the only one in the Valco house that has two brain cells to rub together, comes home for Christmas. Christine, since when do you have a daughter? From looking at her, I'd say since 30 years ago, give or take. Since when do you have a daughter? What the hell kind of question is that? Apparently, this will not do at all, because Drew never had a sister growing up. Of course, spoiler alert, he never had a brother either, and yet he never complained about Brian's presence. But then, if you're trying to bring logic into this movie, you're fighting a losing battle. You know about this too? Yeah, he probably was aware of his own daughter's existence. I'm a genius. Over the course of the next few days, Drew does everything he can to annoy the ever-loving shit out of the Valcos. Granted, this is not hard to do. On the first day of his stay in their house, Tom looks like he is ever so close to strangling the life out of Drew. Why? Because Drew ate his salami. That's all. It's not like he ate something that couldn't easily be replaced. It's just salami. All you have to do is go to the butcher and get more, which he does anyway. But still, he is offended with a capital O that that son of a bitch dared to eat his salami. Careful, Drew. If you drink the last beer, you're bound to get the shovel again. Drew also goes to the trouble of hiring some old guy from a local theater troupe to play his doodah, and does anybody really call their grandfather that? He even gives the entire family scripts to read from so they can enact his ideal family Christmas. During the read-through, Christine keeps accidentally reading the stage directions as her lines, which is really the only genuinely funny thing that happens in this movie. But then they ruin it with this. Brian! If you eat it all up, I will let you sleep with me like I never did when you were little. I will let you sleep with me. What? Our goal is to make you disturbed and confused. Moving on, before this gets any more awkward than it already is, since Alicia wasn't present during the contract signing, and I presume is not getting a cut of the money, she has no incentive to put up with Drew's bullshit. And she is merciless. At first. Oh, by the way, did I mention this is a romantic comedy? Yeah, despite this making no sense whatsoever, she ends up being Drew's love interest. And if you're wondering how they could ever form any kind of connection when they clearly despise each other, allow me to explain. You see, one day, they go sledding. That's it. When they're at the top of the hill, they hate each other's guts. When they're at the bottom of the hill, they're suddenly falling for each other. Literally and figuratively. And now he has COVID. 
And this isn't the only allegedly romantic subplot. There's also one involving the Valco parents, who have pretty much decided they're getting a divorce. The only reason they haven't pulled the trigger yet is they want to wait until after Christmas to break the news to the children. Alicia has no idea, as she no longer lives at home, but Brian has pretty much figured it out. And rather than deal with his unhappy parents, he spends all his time on his computer doing, ahem, <clears throat> research. And when Drew finds out about this, in a rare moment of him not being a whiny, self-absorbed anus licker, he actually tries to help them. Unsurprisingly, his advice is not very good. He focuses more on helping them individually rather than as a couple. And considering the state of his own love life, that actually tracks. He encourages Tom to buy a muscle car he had in his youth, and he encourages Christine to do a glamour photo shoot with Udo f***ing Kier of all people. This does not end well, as while the photo shoot was relatively tasteful, her pictures get photoshopped into porn and posted on the internet, which, of course, Brian finds. Okay, dude. Finding your mom on a porn site would be weird, I get it, but you didn't need to throw the friggin' monitor down the stairs. And that's an old CRT monitor. Those things were huge and heavy. You could have killed someone with that thing, you little shit. But because it's Christmas and the filmmakers want a happy ending, Tom and Christine reconcile. And here's how. I don't want to leave. Then don't. All right, I won't. Okay. And that's literally all it takes to save their marriage. If I didn't know any better, I'd swear that subplot was entirely pointless. Getting back to the other romantic subplot, there's a moment where Alicia talks about a happy childhood memory where she saw a tree completely frozen over. So Drew helps recreate that memory. At first, it's actually kind of sweet. But of course, he goes completely over the top and I have several questions. Where is that angel hanging from? Where are the disco balls that are generating all these lights? And how did Alicia not notice any of this? At the very least, she should have been like, the tree. It's amazing. It's exactly like I ever met. Oh my god, is someone hanging from that crane? Alicia then verbally tears him a new one, and this is another in a long list of reactions that is completely overblown. She's right to be mad at Drew. He blew it. But she acts like he just crucified her dog. This, I think, is the movie's biggest problem. None of the characters act like actual human beings. Nothing they do makes sense. Every reaction is way over the top. Everyone talks like a crazy person. Even Alicia, who at least resembles an actual human, is not immune to this bullshit. And I know exactly what one of you bastards are going to say in the comments. Of course it doesn't make sense. It's a comedy. But here's the thing. Even absurdity still has to make sense. I know that doesn't sound right, but let me give you an example. Take this scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Here is a woman beating a rug with a cat. No one in the real world would ever do such a thing, I hope, but in this movie, we accept it. Why? Because the movie establishes early on that it does not take place in reality. The very first scene in the movie has King Arthur miming riding on a horse while his servant Patsy has two empty halves of coconut and he's banging him together. It sets the stage and sets the audience's expectations appropriately. And so the woman using a cat to clean her rug fits the movie's internal logic. It makes sense by not making sense. There is a method to the madness, if you'll pardon the cliché. Surviving Christmas, on the other hand, has no internal logic. This movie, unlike Holy Grail, takes place in the real world, but none of the characters act like it, and it doesn't work. There is no method, there is only madness. Moving on, Drew's chances of making up with Alicia run into trouble when Missy calls him out of the blue. How, how did you find me? Wait, how did she find you? She didn't find you, she just called your cell phone. She doesn't have to know where you are to call your cell phone. That's the entire point of a cell phone. I'm a genius. Anyway, Missy and her parents show up at the Valco's house and all hell breaks loose when they accidentally discover Mom's private photos. This somehow leads to a reveal that Missy was illegitimate and the man she thought was her biological father actually isn't. Merry Christmas! And this huge reveal is never spoken of again because it doesn't matter. Nothing matters anymore. I'm not sure it ever did. And Drew and Alicia eventually kiss and make up, and we finally find out the real story of Drew's family. I figured there were a few possibilities here. One, 
there's nothing wrong with his family, they're fine, they just don't want anything to do with him because he's an asshole. Two, Drew wants nothing to do with them because they're even bigger assholes than he is. Or three, they're all dead, or at least MIA. Option one would make sense, given everything we've seen about Drew so far. Option two, I could also see. In fact, it seemed like they were kind of hinting in that direction with Drew's ad pitch at the beginning of the movie. And option three seems the least likely, but it would also be the cheapest, considering you don't have to introduce any new characters. So of course that's what they went with. Drew's father skipped town when he was four, and his mother, who worked at a 24-hour diner, would often take a double shift on Christmas because they needed the money. So Drew would spend Christmas alone every year. And then his mother died while he was in college. And that's why he's so desperate to not be alone on Christmas. So with that in mind, how many of these happy childhood memories are actually real? None of them could have happened after the age of four, and how much can a four-year-old really remember? I know he didn't have a brother, so that part's not real. Was any of it real? Or have we just witnessed a jackass going insane? I don't know, and at this point, I don't think I care. And that's Surviving Christmas. It's awful. It's not funny. It makes no sense. The subplots go nowhere. Major reveals are abruptly forgotten. And pretty much everyone in the movie is horrible. There are no heroes here. There aren't even anti-heroes. There are only assholes. It's an absolute mess. I am amazed that Ben Affleck's career survived this movie. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad it did. We got Argo and Gone Girl, and even though I'm not a fan of Zack Snyder's DC superhero movies, Affleck was a pretty good Batman. So I guess it all worked out in the end. But boy, did he go through a rough patch. And this year, haven't we all? I think I speak for everyone when I say 2020 can go fuck itself. We got people out of work, going hungry, suffering long-term effects from COVID if it hasn't killed them outright. Various idiots cannot be bothered to do the bare minimum when it comes to not spreading this terrible virus. And when we've turned to our leaders for support and guidance, they've disappointed us at every turn. But there is still hope. We have new leadership coming in who at least give off the appearance of giving a shit. Vaccines are slowly rolling out. There is light at the end of the tunnel. And I hope that when we find this light in 2021, we do not find out it was an oncoming train. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, wear your mask, wash your hands and all that. And I will see you all in the new year. Happy holidays. that that son of a bitch dared to eat a salami. Careful, Drew. You eat the last beer, eat the last beer. What?